welcome everyone uh, to our second year and our first meeting of Teach Climate. Um, I'm super excited to kick off this year. Um, we had a lovely conversation at the end of last year and talked about what went well and what didn't. And I definitely thought on all of that all summer and uh, changed some things around. Um, but I'm very excited that you all joined us today. Um, I just want to go over a couple of quick things. Um, I'm just going to keep sharing my face. I have a, a slideshow, but I'm going to use it as notes. Um, so first of all, um, I am from Climate Generation, a Will Steger legacy. Uh, we're a nonprofit in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, our mission is to empower individuals and their communities to engage in solutions to climate change. Um, we do that working with a number of different audiences. Um, we work with youth, mainly in Minnesota, um, but uh, we do have a, a, a somewhat broad base. Um, we um, work with the public, uh, and do convenings across, uh, across the state, and have actually taken those on the road too, just to get people talking about climate change. Um, we work with influentials, uh, business leaders, and elected officials to help them um, push policy. And then we work with educators, and that's my role as climate change education manager. Um, I write curriculum, and I do um, speaking engagements, conferences. I sometimes get into classrooms and talk with students. Um, and then I get to lead this really awesome uh, group. And uh, there my husband's trying to wrangle the dog. <laughs> um, but I'm super excited to, uh, to kick this off again this year. Um, we've got a really great group of books um, that we're going to be reading this year. But even if you don't want to read the books, that's okay. Um, just come, um, come with your questions, come with your um, successes and your challenges in teaching climate change. Um, so just real quick, if you don't want to have your video on today, you don't have to. Um, you can turn that off. Um, if stuff's going on um, where you're at, just mute yourself. Doesn't sound like anyone's got too much background noise, so no worries. Feel hey, free to – oh, go ahead. Can you see me now? Yes. All right. I Good just job. stole some camera from somebody else's office. Oh, perfect. <laughs> no, that's perfect. Well done. Good troubleshooting. Um, so feel free to use the chat box if you want to type in stuff as um, people are talking. Um, otherwise, like, you know, it's a small group. Um, so feel free to, to just raise uh, questions if you would like. Um, just a couple quick things about the, the network as a whole. Um, this is for you. Um, you know, we have kind of an outline of stuff we want to talk about, but if you've got ideas or questions or things that you want to talk about, feel free. Um, please feel no guilt in preparing for this. A lot of times people didn't read books last year. Again, no problem. Like just come maybe by the end of each meeting, you will be inclined to read it. Um, but, but no worries. Um, but if you do come participate, have some fun. Um, feel free to bring your adult beverage or, or just put on oh, your Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> because it's on the desk right now. Oh, please, please go ahead. <laughs> this is very much adult time. Um, invite a colleague, spread the word. Um, we meet um, approximately every third week. Um, it'll be at seven o'clock, but we are going to vary the days. So it won't just be on Wednesdays like it was last year. Um, and then this is a partnership um, between uh, Climate Generation and um, University of Nebraska-Lincoln. So I will let Devardi uh, say a couple of things if she wishes. A uh, couple of what things. One, this is, this is um, I feel, my informal personal time, which I enjoy very much because I get to semi-read where not not completely reading the book is also pass and accepted <laughs> and kids running in here and there are also accepted so this is my personal time i enjoy the conversations we end up having and i also enjoy uh, packing in with different you know people we have we have teachers educators we have we have higher ed people. We have all sorts of people here, so I enjoy that. But yes, uh, my name is Devarney, and I am a researcher here at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. I primarily work with teachers, uh, K-16, K-16 through for climate literacy. 
And um, my background, doctoral work, is also focused on climate literacy and its understanding. So Climate Gen was also there 10, ten years ago. So it, I feel very lucky to be always in touch with you guys and learn from you guys. So, so well, welcome. Thank you very much, Devardi. And I will say that this uh, book club and network was really started with Devardi's push. So we really appreciate that. <laughs> there was one book club earlier, which Kristen Years used ago. to do. Yep. And I missed all of those meetings. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad we got you now. <laughs> yes. So I was like, there was a guilt there that I missed everything. <laughs> <laughs> well, you did very well last year. So we'll see. Awesome. Yes. Great. Well, I'm just going to give you a real quick rundown of the uh, evening and then um, we'll jump right in. So um, this first meeting, uh, we read uh, The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind. And this is um, a unique book because there are three different books, um, one for uh, adults, one for kind of middle readers, and then one for kids picture book. So Whichever one you were able to look at, uh, great. Uh, they all tell the same story, uh, just in different ways. Um, but we'll do some introductions real quick, especially because we have a small group. Um, we'll discuss the book. Um, you can share your thoughts, how you use the book, um, just you know what you uh, what you thought of it in in general. Um, no, you don't need to be profound. You just kind of share what you want. Um, and then we've got a wonderful guest speaker, um, Beth Sohort, um, from now Clean Grid Alliance. Um, and she'll be chatting with us about the uh, wind industry and what they do um, over at Clean, Clean Grid Alliance. Uh, actually, I just saw the name change uh, when I was looking at your website a little bit earlier. So congrats on that. Uh, and then if there's any other questions and stuff, and then I'll just uh, wrap up with a few things and talk about our next uh, meeting in October. So if everyone would like to, I'll call on you because I know it's kind of hard who's going to go next, but if you just want to give your name, where and what you teach, and then if you did read the book, just one word that you would just uh, use to describe the book. So Kimberly, you're on the top of my screen if you want to start. Um, Kimberly Reddick, and I teach at Hopewell Valley um, Regional School District in Pennington, New Jersey. I'm about eight miles from Princeton, right next to the Delaware River, where George Washington crossed on that fateful night. So there's lots of history in the area. I've been in this district for 18 years. Originally, I'm from Oregon and taught in the Portland Public School District. Um, I teach, I moved over to middle school two years ago. This is my third year in sixth grade iSTEM science, um, but had been a elementary teacher for 23 years. Um, so it's been a big change. However, there's been a lot of benefits to coming over to the middle school and a lot of opportunities for teacher research opportunities. Um, and have really enjoyed that and the learning and the science, but still feel like I'm behind the eight ball in all of it. So um, want to keep that going. Um, I chose to read the adult version, wanting an adult book to read this summer. Um, kind of wishing I'd picked up the young adult reader, just trying to make notes in that and where I could fit it in with my kids. Um, if I just want to come up with one thing, I, I would say curiosity. Um, the fact that he was curious and he persevered in his ideas, um, even when everybody else was like, you're crazy. Sorry. <laughs> One word, curiosity. Great. Thank you. Betsy. Hey there. Um, I'm Betsy. I uh, work in Tucson, Arizona for Arizona Project Well and um, work we provide teacher professional development and also um, direct education in uh, third through 12th grade classrooms about water. And um, I read the adult one, and but I got the, the middle school one, I guess the young adult one from the library. And I really like the pictures in the young adult one. <laughs> There's some nice photographs. And my word for the book is innovative. Great. Devardi, you shared a little bit, but you, you want to share your word. Betsy took my word. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's really important. Yes, innovation. That was in my mind. <laughs> Great. Okay, Beth? Hey, 
Um, I'm Beth. Holt. So um, we just rebranded our organization and announced our new name last week. We used to be called Wind on the Wires. And so we um, work on things behind the light switch, like policies and rules and regulations that govern the electric system. And we are trying to make um, the rules a level playing field for renewables, which are, uh, we work on wind and solar, newer resources to the grid. And so we um, um, work a lot on state policy to drive utilities to uh, renewables. We um, work on technical and engineering issues and legal issues for um, helping renewable developers enter projects to the grid. Um, and then work on a lot of state policies like uh, renewable portfolio standards, renewable energy standards, um, utility, electric utility resource planning, um, and work a lot with both the wind and solar industry. So I'll be talking about wind tonight, but um, I'm very much looking forward to um, the discussion. So hopefully I can um, provide some comments and then would love to answer questions or Think about how you can use um, materials on wind energy or renewables uh, in the space that you work in. Great, thank you. Uh, Heidi. Hi, um, I teach in Brainerd, Minnesota. Um, we're kind of a rural area, but we have, it's a, our school is very small. Brainerd is kind of a bigger city in the rural area, but um, I am a fifth and sixth grade science teacher and I also am our environmental education curriculum person because we're an environmental charter school. So um, a friend and I actually, a colleague and I were talking about how we need to have a school-wide read and we chose this as our school-wide read for this coming school year. Awesome. So I read the young adult version to kind of see um, how it was and I loved it and then I also got the picture books so each of our classrooms has the picture book and then we're going to with our mostly our sixth graders we're probably going to read the young adult version but yeah I'm super excited and I liked it a lot um I would say maybe inspiring hopefully for the kids <laughs> would be a word awesome I'm so excited you'll definitely need to let us know how that goes mm -hmm. great thank you and Sarah, we just start doing a quick introduction, name, where you work, what you teach, and then if you have one word to describe the book. Um, so Sarah Niemeyer, I teach in, at Wabasha Kellogg in Wabasha, Minnesota. Um, I teach junior high science and high school earth science, including an earth's climate um, class. This is my second year yep, <laughs> with climate generation curriculum. Um, and for this book, um, very easy read. I have the adult um, version, so to say, and I'd say very easy read, but for lack of time, I didn't get through all of the, all the book, it's but okay. um, very inspiring from what I've read so far and just, you know, getting into this young man's life and um, the trials that he's had to overcome and then I watched the quick five minute TED video um, of him <laughs> just to awesome. recap and yeah, pretty amazing story. Great. Yeah, there are some great resources um, and I'll, I'll send out a few uh, links and things afterwards uh, to the rest of the crew along with this video if they are so inclined to watch. Um, thank you everyone, that was wonderful. Um, so yeah, I guess I'd just like to open it up to um, other general thoughts about uh, the version that you read how you would use it with your students, um, just what you thought about it, key parts that stood out to you, et cetera, et cetera. If anybody wants to jump on in, the floor is yours. Um, I think the first thing we were talking about at our school as having it as a school-wide read, as we were discussing it, we decided we're not going to start that until end of February. We're gonna kick it off with our literacy night and just have copies available for families so have it more of a community thing too mm -hmm. and then um, the reason kind of for doing it is in the spring 
one of the teachers said it kind of goes with like wind and we can make windmills and do kites and different like talk about wind properties and weather too and so weave that into it too and just different you know kind of the earth science aspect of it too mm -hmm. awesome I'll talk. Um, so I got two different aspects of using it. Um, my background's originally engineering, and I've been doing a lot with underwater robots with teachers. And the whole engineering aspect is really cool in the book and how he did the problem solving. I loved his circuit breaker idea. <laughs> like, whoa, that's cool. So because we have a lot with students soldering and doing circuitry and all that kind of stuff and making things from scratch and, you know, trying to put things together to make them work. So I like that. And then I was just in a meeting today uh, on climate adaptability um, across the university and different research projects. And one of the um, people talked about energy, water, food nexus, and he's working a lot with that in Africa. You know, that was a big driver of his whole project. And just the way he described being, you know, you talk about famine, but really living it through his words was, was pretty powerful. I would agree with the way that he described his whole surroundings. I, I come from an area that is high economic and the kids have very little understanding of what that would be like and trying to get them to um, feel or understand what he's going through and he still persevered in order to go after his dreams and what he thought was possible. Um, because my kids, they so easily give up. Um, they can't do it the first time, um, I need help, let me go to Google for the answer. And so getting them to really understand that if at first you don't succeed, you try again, and then you try again, and you try again, and again, and again. Mm -hmm. um, trying to get them to um, really understand his situation, that he's coming from very little to nothing. I will add here, I'll, I'll build on that same thing. So one of the things, well, first, I didn't know where M Malawi was, so I looked it up. And then uh, the other thing, um, I was reading parts of this book to my son, he's, he's a third grader. But uh, one thing that he didn't get was when the drought happens and uh, they don't, they run out of food. So he kept on saying that, well, don't, don't they have food in their, in their pantry? I mean, don't they have food saved. Don't they have money in the bank? So then it, then it, then it, it, I didn't get that in the beginning, but then I got that both him and I, my son and even me, we've never been exposed to a, um, like a year by year existence. Mm -hmm. So there, there is a level of disconnect. I mean, yes, for him, even for me, because I have, I, I, my, even my parents didn't want that generation where there was, there was a yearly or monthly existence, you know? So, so then when you think about it, like, no, when the rains come, then there's something to eat. And then there's time to think about, oh, what was I doing? And what was I learning? That's a whole different mindset and to get into it it took some critical thinking for both of us you know he's 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 eight and i'm 40 but yet yeah, to get to that it's like no uh, education is not a part of everyday life it comes after these needs are met so that was something that the critical thinking had to had to come into so that would be something if i were to use this book is i would i put some elements of critical thinking into it have students read some some parts and then ask some special guided questions about it the other thing was that uh the drought the the Drought, as we see it in, in developed world, is different than the drought that, that he experienced. So if we, we also have some drought, you know, last year the rains were, the rains were quite less and there were drought-like conditions, but the impact on economy wasn't that uh, huge as he 
felt. So, so you know, the, you could see the policy, you could see the politics, and you know, the everything is controlled by the natural resources, which is the crop production. So it just shatters down when the drought hits. So those things, you, 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 again, to me, critical thinking, and then uh, integrating it with the natural resource use. So that's that was my piece. Those are great. I think the uh, difference in looking at the developed versus the developing world and how we see or how it happens when we have drought, you know, we kind of, we have money in the bank as a country. We have all of these grocery stores. We have, you know, all these ways of getting food and resources, even if we're in that situation. So that's very interesting. And kind of what you were going, what you were saying, Kimberly, about, you know, not, most of our students maybe not being able to understand that. Um, and not being having been in in that situation before, these are great. I was going to bring up that um, we're going into the our changing climate through climate generation, and it's going to focus on changes in the Arctic and how you know we can we have a hard time focusing on climate change around us because we don't see as many impacts of it here um, in the United States, where the Arctic is you know devastated right now. So I could bring this part into it too. It's not just those reasons, you know, we have our coldest regions, but it's also our warmest regions. It's impacting our extremes. And so we're going to be the last to really notice. And, but because of these extreme locations, such as where we're growing a lot of crops and now turning into a desert, we're going to be losing on resources eventually. So it's good for them to see that, that there's going to be issues. And I even bring up the issue of water. You know, we might have a civil war, so to say, over lack of water and being here in Minnesota we have access to a lot of it and especially with Lake Superior so what if someday somebody comes knocking on the door going can we have some water because we have access to that so mm -hmm. just brings up some really good points for lack of resources where we don't necessarily see it here but it will eventually impact everyone absolutely no those are great great points yeah, and the connection to like to the Arctic that Sarah is doing is there's so many um, native communities in the Arctic that are subsistence communities and they rely mm -hmm. on, you know, living off the land, living off of hunting and they have to be able to be those conditions where they go hunting just like the polar bears and yeah, there's a lot of that. Someone's kids are loud. <laughs> Mute, Sarah. <laughs> They're pounding on the floor. Oh, they just want your love. <laughs> no worries. Sorry, Betsy. Go ahead. Okay. This is why I love this group. It's just, you know, we're, we're all adults and just talking about good stuff, but kids are still there. Grading papers, it's still happening. <laughs> I, I like what Sarah said about it's really affecting the extremes. We see it up in the Arctic and then we see it, um, you know, like at the equator. But what I try to get my kids to understand, because we just got very little, minimal, um, effective um, Hurricane Florence that came through New Jersey just yesterday. Um, it was, you know, huge rains all day long. We didn't flood. Trying to get my kids to, to look at the storms that are coming through and the categories of them and what is happening about that, does that have any connection to what is happening? Is it because, because they said Florence wasn't going to hit the East Coast because it was originated too far north and the waters are supposed to be colder, but the waters aren't colder anymore, right? It hasn't been since 1851 that a storm that originated in that area actually made it to the United States. So trying to get them to see whether whether they are truly connections, but trying to get them to question. And I and I think um, just his situation and that he's he really is living year to year and it's all on natural resources. It has nothing to do with the amount of you know work and energy he puts, not nothing, but what he puts into it. Um, if Mother Nature says it's not gonna happen, it's the food is not there, you know. And and that's hard for our kids to get they don't understand that when they always have on their table you know so just something to really trying to hone in on them i think a connection we can make at our school is we have a school garden and so just kind of explaining to them you know what if 
what if this was our only source of our food? Because we, <laughs> we even had preschoolers out the other day and they were like, so this is where our food comes from, like our lunch. And I'm like, well, <laughs> no, but <laughs> some, maybe a little a tiny bit, but kind of explaining, you know, what happens when the plants don't get enough water and what if this was magnified, you know, the older kids would kind of get that, I think. And I mean, we kind of analyze, you know, what grew well and why, why it did and why it didn't. And even the sprinklers don't have everything evenly. So, you know, some of the soils drier than others and kind of just making those connections in the local scale too of saying, when just growing things and then what happens if it's an entire country you know and then where do so we get our food from the supermarket but we also talk a lot at our school where does that come from and then we talk about local food and everything but i think just making those connections too and then hoping they would get it a little more too no oh, i think that's great um i think kids everywhere struggle with where they're they don't know where their food comes from um, and so making that connection to the garden and seeing like, actually, maybe we'll just get a few carrots from here and, you know, some tomatoes. Yeah, we get a lot of carrots, but yeah. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's about, probably that's about it. it. <laughs> yeah. This prepares a nice snack um, yep. beyond that, you know, it's coming from elsewhere. But that's a great connection. I think, yeah, even young kids can, can start to see that. Great. Other kind of themes that you picked up the, on? Um, oh, go ahead. Yeah, one of the things that I found in my book was um, when he created the circuit breaker and, you know, finally he said, you know, if it hadn't worked, all of his clothes and blankets would be gone, you know, and because it would have burned down his house um, with the uh, wires falling on the roof and his friend Jeffrey's going, yeah, that's great, but I think a better solution would be to fix your roof. <laughs> and so I like how sometimes people look for the hard solutions when there's really easier solutions and i think that's a good lesson for kids to think of too when they're when they're designing things and creating stuff i think that speaks to the climate change solutions as a whole i think people really you know they they one can get paralyzed you know not knowing what to do um, but then to like wanting to do all kinds of things or wanting to do like something that's really crazy when in fact if you're not recycling, turning off your lights and, you know, trying to bike to work, those are places where you can start, you know, that are, that are much, much simpler. The author had a, had a, a guest blog on his own website. Uh, and they, that's what the, the title is. When it comes to climate change, we should start small, fail fast, fast and dream big. So, okay. Yeah, so and he gave in his, in his blog, he's giving a lot of examples about the small thing. And one of the things that I liked was design thinking, which also aligns with you know, design-based thinking or teaching design-based uh, curricular modules. So to think about innovative designs for little smaller problems that you can attack and, and and what he says is when you do small things, you feel good because you finish that project and you feel you've done and you make progress. So that, that was a blog uh, on his own blog. So I like the idea of recycling um, that he was like a dumpster diver. He was going to find things that no longer had any use that nobody wanted to do. And there's so many things that we just throw in the trash. Um, we have a hard time making sure that they get to where they need to be recycled and then reuse things. Um, so I, I like that he was always going back um, and finding things and thinking of new ways to use something. I think what that made me think of is how there's such a big push for maker spaces now. And yeah. it's kind of funny because it feels like like in my parents generation that was just they did that too like they would find things around the farm and they would find like things you know on the street and they would just take them apart and play with them and I think kids now just they have fun with it because it's kind of foreign but they don't quite know how yet to put them back together or like yeah. what to do with them and so I mean we have like snap circuits and things at our school, but it's kind of trying to make, maybe we can use this to make that connection of, now you know how to make a circuit, can we take bare bones, real things, and make something with that too. 
Cool. My kids can use recycled items just to make like sculptures and like glue things together, but they don't use those items to actually make something that would improve something. And, and that's where I want them to get, to, to actually make something that's useful um, out of what's left over. So it's more of a creative aspect versus an engineering. Absolutely. Or to replace something that you have or that was broken and without going and getting a new one, what can right. you do with what you have? Right. Mm -hmm. Well, I would love to share something real quick and then um, I'll hand the floor over to Beth. Um, if you've got more things to say about the book, we can come back at the end. Um, but in November, uh, we at Climate Generation are releasing a large humanities focused, I guess, box of stuff. So one of those things that is in there, um, we are working with um, Lowell School, which I've mentioned in the past, um, we helped change their sixth grade curriculum, uh, sixth grade humanities curriculum to be totally climate change centric. So all of their social studies and ELA um, lessons are all climate change centric. So Natalie Stapert, um, who's a sixth grade teacher and their humanities curriculum coordinator, I don't know, that's not her exact title, so I apologize. Um, but she has written curriculum curriculum, maybe a module for Boy Who Harnessed the Wind. What that includes is um, kind of an explanation of how you would use it in different classes. You could use it in a social studies class, civics or geography or something, maybe not civics, but geography um, or economics. You could use it in, in different ELA classes. Um, there's a documentary um, that has been made around the, the book. So it's got lots of explanation but very open-ended. Then she has a series of worksheets for the young readers edition, which includes vocab and a lot of questions. Um, and then she's found articles, real life articles that relate, relate to Malawi and their droughts, uh, renewable energy from around the world. Uh, and then she's made uh, worksheets that pair with those articles. Um, and then like I mentioned, the documentary, there's a worksheet that goes along with that. So we're going to package all of that for her and put it on our website and you can download it for free. Awesome. So that'll be in November. We're super excited. We're just putting it together right now and laying it all out. Um, has anyone read A Long Walk to Water? Yeah. We're also doing that. So that will come out in November as well. And then hopefully there'll be at least two more. Um, Exodus, uh, one of the books we read last year. <laughs> Um, I'll push her, Sarah, to try and get that one done faster. Um, you're muted. I'm on mute. <laughs> just saying, I just ordered my books this week, so. Yay! Yay. When do you know when you're going to start? I don't know. They're going to come next week, and we'll okay. see. <laughs> All right, because I know she has uh, pieces um, of it, of Exodus Sun, I believe. Um, so even if it's just some kind of, like, questions that you use mm -hmm. while you're doing that, but. So cool. glad you're using that book. I am. I love it. <laughs> Yay. Um, so yeah, so that'll be all released in November. So just wanted to let you all know, um, we're super excited. Um, we've really been focusing the last year or two years on the humanities um, and getting climate change into social studies and ELA classes. So there'll be a big push for us um, this fall. So we're super excited. But just wanted to mention that. And I will turn it over to Beth. Um, if you want to give some insight into the wind industry and then uh, everyone create their questions uh, that you want to ask. Yes, please. Um, thank you so much. This is um, really exciting to talk to everyone and, and see how you're incorporating things into your classes. Um, so maybe I'll just start with a kind of an overview. Um, Clean Grid Alliance works mostly on the large utility scale projects. And so my numbers um, are kind of for the large utility scale installations that are happening across the United States. But um, we work very closely with the American Wind Energy Association, the trade association in DC that represents the wind industry. And I think one of the, um, the most, uh, the largest things that has happened in the last few years is that um, we've had a production tax credit at the federal level that has helped developers do projects. and 
Um, that's been in place for a while to really jumpstart the industry. But the cost of wind energy is falling so much and it's becoming so economic that even when the subsidy goes away, that support goes away, wind is still going to be competitive with other new forms of generation. So that's very good news for being able to deploy renewable resources like wind. Utility companies that are looking at how to serve customers, whether they're homeowners or businesses or commercial customers who are asking for more renewable energy, they're going to be able to deliver that product economically to everyone. So we've really seen a big uptick in corporations being interested in renewable energy, both wind energy and solar energy. Um, we have lots of companies as well as cities and townships that have committed to renewable energy goals and you know companies like Google, Walmart, um, um, Apple have um, have all committed to running on 100% renewable energy and they're just working their way towards achieving that goal. And that's important for a couple reasons. I mean, it it really um, it really sets a good example for utilities and others. Um, it kind of is the right thing to do um, with these corporations who can give back in in this very visible way so people can understand um, that they're actually kind of putting money where their mouth is. Um, so that's been a very big driver of wind development in the United States. So about last year, about 50% of the projects that were done were done for corporate purchase. And the other, you know, the other 50 was probably um, mostly utility companies purchasing wind energy through power purchase agreements. So just some statistics that I would love to um, work with you guys if there are any specific fact sheets or um, materials that we can provide that would be helpful in your classroom. For example, um, you know, you all have talked about, you know, saving the air, saving water, um, the, the, connect the, the um, connection with food production. Um, there are certainly facts and figures around air quality and around water savings from doing renewable energy like wind that um, that we have st statistics of, uh, about um, that could be helpful maybe as part of um, a lesson plan or um, teaching. And then I was just um, trying to think about, okay, so on on the webinar or on Zoom today, we have somebody from New Jersey and we've got somebody from Arizona and somebody, uh, two people from Minnesota or three people um, with Jenna and myself, or four people. Um, so New Jersey um, doesn't have a lot of wind development because you don't have a lot of um, land, but offshore is coming out on the East Coast. And it's from coming on uh, Block Island. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. So I have a colleague that was just out at Block Island um, two nights ago. They had a tour out there. They had 200 people that took a tour out there. And she said, um, you know, what they were seeing was just incredible. She sent me a couple pictures. And um, so New Jersey has nine megawatts right now. Arizona has uh, 268. Oh, my gosh. And Minnesota has 3,699. So um, <laughs> the the largest states um, from in rank order, Texas has twenty three thousand two hundred and sixty two megawatts. So I have this whole this whole map that tells how many megawatts are in each state, and that might be something that might be for our class to see. Shockingly enough, I think I pretty much have the same map in my Google Slides to finish this call up. <laughs> it's very close. Okay. Perfect. So, um, so right now across the whole United States, we have 90,000, just over 90,000 megawatts installed wind capacity. And that's more than 54,000 wind turbines operating in 41 states plus Guam and Puerto Rico. So we've got a pretty wide distribution of wind across the whole U.S. with the exception of the Southeast because they 
just don't have the wind resource, they're going to do much more solar energy than wind. Um, and so those are a few facts and figures. You know, um, it was interesting to hear Betsy, you talk about the engineering aspects and the, the circuitry. Um, there's so many aspects of wind energy for kids to be excited about. Right now, the um, number one or number two job, depending on the day, is wind turbine technician. And so it is a, it's a job that kids can do with just a couple years of technical training. Um, not everybody is cut out to, you know, have a four-year degree. It's a really well-paying, you know, family-supporting job that somebody can have. Um, you know, we're, we're um, trying to figure out kind of on a daily basis, is wind technician or solar installer the number one or the number two job? And right now, they're both kind of either number one or number two because of all the renewables development that's happening across the country. So that's a really exciting job growth opportunity for kids. Um, just another link that I uh, can think about, I was in North Dakota a couple of weeks ago to help um, do a groundbreaking for a new wind farm that's going up. And the utility contributed $25,000 to the local school for a STEM lab. And they had uh, kids at the dedication or the groundbreaking they had just completed their first um, kind of activity in the STEM lab, and the kids were so excited. And so they had a couple of the kids talk about the project they had. Did. And so, you know, we're seeing um, we're seeing air, you know, air quality, water savings, um, lots of uh, climate aspects to renewable energy development, like wind development. We're seeing job creation. Um, and we're seeing um, contributions from developers or utilities to communities to be able to educate the youth um, with, uh, you know, in STEM areas. And so, um, you know, you could really talk about lots of different buckets of good that are coming from deploying renewable energy like wind across the U.S. And so um, those were kind of my quick facts. Uh, that I was going to share, but glad to try to answer questions or um, talk about other things that you're interested in. Thank you, Beth. That was wonderful. Any questions from anybody? I have a question. What are the stats for Nebraska? Because I couldn't see them. <laughs> Oh, I forgot where you're from, Nebraska, 1,445 megawatts. So Nebraska, you know, um, it's a public power state, and so uh, they've had to work really hard to determine how they're going to let wind development happen. Mm -hmm. um, because utilities really had a pretty tight control over what gets constructed in the state, and mm -hmm. so the policy work that folks on the ground have done to change uh, laws and rules have really created the platform in Nebraska in the last couple of years to allow wind to flourish. Yeah. So it's just been a pretty recent phenomenon in Nebraska that uh, you've had a lot more wind farm development. Yeah, I was curious just to hear that because when I moved, so I'm from Minnesota, that would be my home state. So I moved here for my job here three years ago. And that's when I had started hearing these uh, conversations. And uh, so I work at School of Natural Resources. So there's a lot of uh, policy meetings happening first year. And so, but then that's not exactly my area. So I was not a part of those conversations. So then I was like, oh, what is happening here? And I see my utility sending me flyers to Washington. And this year, the flyers are there. That means if I can opt in a pro program for conserving energy, changing my thermal stat, those are all, they came out this year. So there's been some, some actual real steps to reaching out customers and uh, I don't know the commercial sector, but definitely the residential sector and trying to make them think about alternative forms of energy or saving energy. That's really great. I mean, I think utilities are understanding these days that they need to be more responsive 
to their customers, no mm-hmm. matter what, no matter whether you're a residential customer or a commercial customer, small business, whatever the case may be. And the beauty of wind power right now is that it's cost effective, and so utilities don't have to um, collect a lot more money. Customers mm-hmm. actually be able to add a wind for farm or wind resources to their portfolio. It's cost effective if. Did we lose her? That's that yeah, you lost, lost your her. audio. Can't hear you. <laughs> There now, Beth? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we cut out there the last couple sentences. Oh, I'm sorry. No worries. Um, I was muted, so I was talking to no one. <laughs> oh, so my phone is still, um, it's still on. I wonder why it cut out. But I was just saying that uh, wind and solar energy are so cost effective right now that it's that's one reason that utilities are really adding a lot is because they can do it economically. And so you kind of get this, you know, triple win. It's good for the environment. It's good for communities. It's good for um, our, um, just a lot of different reasons right now. And that's, that's really helped. But the other thing that's really helped is people are speaking up about what they want. And so utilities are having to do something about that. They're shutting down coal plants. They're making plans to change their resource mix. And Renewable energy like wind uh, power is going to be a large part of um, what gets what they replace those existing coal plants with. But Beth, do you, do you see that the utilities are more likely to work with wind over solar? Um, my family, most of my family is in the Nevada area, and my um, son-in-law worked for solar, and he actually got out of it because it the utilities had stopped there. It was like they were no longer giving incentives for people. And they said, no, there's a cap. No more can be done. And all the houses in Las Vegas could have solar panels on the top. And they're like, nope, sorry, it's not happening anymore because the utility companies are losing money. So how do you fight back against that when it's such a good thing, but because they're no longer making a profit, they're stopping it. That's a great question. So, Nevada has kind of been ground zero for that battle, for the net metering battle. And um, it, it is hard. I mean, we're in this big transition period where we're going from this old fleet of dirty plants, generation plants, to a cleaner uh, future uh, in our generation. So there's this big shift happening. And utilities are finding it hard to manage um, both the you know the literal switching over of the power plants and then the um, the earnings or the money that they need to to keep uh, you know being viable businesses. But um, so I think that's why we tend to uh, think: Are there solutions where you can give customers what they want, but you can give utilities enough of incentive, you know, through redoing rate structures or kind of the, the, the carrot approach. Um, you know, can we figure out something in it for them so that we can keep them whole, but we can do this big generation shift? It's a real dilemma because it does cost money and until we get renewable energy valued in the right way for what it's contributing to the grid, it's not it's it's going to be a fight with the utilities so the dilemma is you know how to keep them profitable at the same time we we do this great big shift and um uh i think nevada nevada's got a little bit better i mean they kind of reverse course i think after they took such drastic measures um but i also know that uh there's going to be a ballot initiative i think this year um, no, maybe that's New Mexico, but Arizona. um, Arizona's doing that. 
<laughs> or doing the ballot initiative on the yeah. renewable tape that Tom Steyer is, is, um, right. is yeah, is doing. Um, is there I, something that the average person can do to help the utilities understand? Like, how can I help my kids? Because I said every little bit counts for, for my, teaching my kids that if you recycle that post-it, it just goes down the line, right? So every little thing you can do, how can I help my kids or their families understand what could they do to help this process? Yeah, that's a great question. So it's kind of like, how can you be a steward of our resources? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I think one of the best things kids, kids can do is use their voice, speak up, tell, you know, can they, um, can they organize somehow and write letters or make posters or, um, you know, have some other organizing activity to have a visible show of, of what they're for. We want this, not this. We want, you know, our, um, we're the future and we want our future to look like X. And so, um, you know, the first thing is that people speak up and they really tell the utilities what they want. Find the pathway to get there is kind of the second piece, but the utilities need to hear loud and strong that they need to struggle with this question because people really do care. I think in energy, too often, can you guys still hear me? Okay, too so often in energy, you just flip the light switch and you expect to be there and you never think anything about how is it produced how does it get to my light switch what impacts does energy production have on our environment and so teaching the kids about how energy travels to the light switch can open their minds to you know think about what else we need to do it's just you know such an automatic that um we have this kind of expectation. We're not a third world country where, you know, we have solar panels and, and not a lot of electric grid. And so when the sun goes down, our lights go out. So we just don't have the experiences to, um, to really understand, like, like you guys were talking about some of the things with, with the kids that you teach. But um, so I would say the number one thing is, is to speak up. And then to educate the kids on all the possibilities of having a career in renewable energy. Um, that is a, a big piece of the puzzle. We need people who are actually willing to go into these fields and um, understand that there are good paying jobs in working in renewable energy, whether you're on the policy side or you're on the construction side or you're, um, you know, whatever aspect you are participating in, um, you're making a difference. I was just going to give you an update on the Arizona referendum. So we have a, the referendum that came from Tom Steyer. And unfortunately, the only, you know, it, it's something that the voters signed a petition for, and we wanted to do 50% renewable energy by 2030. And, um, Unfortunately, all the money that's coming in is anti-renewable, <laughs> and so all the commercials are about, you know, your rates are going to go up, and it's going to hurt seniors, and, you know, we don't want to do this, and so all the money's against it right now. I'm afraid it's not going to pass, but it is a start, I guess, because it was, like, got on the ballot because of um, petition signatures, so. Yeah, and, you know, Tom worked in a couple other states, so in Michigan, the utilities took a little bit different tact. They actually came to a settlement agreement with the advocates to make some additional commitments on renewable energy. So in Michigan, they actually, um, they were at a 15% renewable portfolio standard or renewable energy standard. And both the two largest utilities in the state made additional commitments um, that, the, so that the advocates decided not to go forward with the ballot initiative. But it had the desired effect of getting people excited about the possibility of increasing renewables. And the utilities left, there was a ballot initiative, I think about five years ago in Michigan, they spent $10 million fighting the ballot initiative. 
think of you know how that money could have been invested a lot better mm-hmm. than utilities fighting and we're probably the ones that were paying for that because they get to recover all those costs crazy that's outrageous um i think one the biggest thing like where you're talking about getting students involved um my husband works for a big utility in the state actually and he has said basically i mean they're doing it because of legislation like minnesota has a certain percentage by whatever year of clean energy and so if they didn't have that i don't think they would work towards it because they're big business but it's kind of maybe the students then need to write to their congressmen or maybe they need to write to their state representatives kind of thing and I mean, even city council and see what there is, you know, what is your local utility doing? Is it a co-op? Like, how is it working? Do they have power over what they can do or is it at a bigger level too? Like kind of looking at that and then just same, like saying this, we're your future, you know, and this is what we want. Right. And, and that's really true. I mean, one thing we're doing in the Minnesota legislature and in other states too, is really trying to groom renewable champions. So um, again, you know, asking the legislator to be for clean energy is a great start for um, somebody to, to write a letter. Um, I would say, though, that the policy that was put in place might have been the initial reason that utilities started doing renewable energy. Yes, they have laws and requirements they have to meet, but it's really the economics right now that are driving the additional wind and solar energy that we see. There are a lot of states or utilities who have already met their renewable energy requirements that are in law. And now it's really customer demand and the economics of wind and solar that are driving utilities to do above and beyond what they're required to do legally or in statute. So um, things are shifting. You know, when things become cost effective, it causes utilities to look at it in a more positive light. And particularly if they have, if they're a rate regulated utility and have to go before a public utilities commission who approves, um, you know, what resources they can build and what rates they can recover, they have to show the the regulators that um, they are buying the least cost resource. And that happens to be renewable energy right now. That so solar is like extremely it. cheap right now. So yeah. That is a wonderful place to stop. And we can keep going after eight. I just want to be cognizant of the time. And um, Krista has joined us. Um, she is a professor from Hawaii. And I want to give her a couple of minutes to give her two cents on um, Boy Who Harnessed the Wind. She um, volunteered to write a blog for Climate Generation. And FYI, if anybody wants to write blogs for us, we send you the book for free for that month. Um, so you can let me know. Um, but yeah, if you want to unmute yourself and share a little bit, you go right ahead. Hi, everybody. So my name is not Shawnee. I'm using <laughs> someone else's account. And I don't always look so uh, wrecked but we're doing a (laughs) campus waste audit today i'm in hawaii so it's still the middle of the afternoon and uh we've been doing a waste audit so that's why i look so a mess um uh i and i and i apologize um for jumping on the call a little bit late but in terms of the the blog and my thoughts on the book um one thing i really love about what what I learned about the book is that it has these three versions, right? The kids version and middle school and the adult version. So I read the full length adult novel. And in terms of the blog, I'd love to mention something about the children's book or the middle school version. Did you guys read those or which version did you read? And is there some succinct statement or observation that I missed? that you can let me know, and then I'll tell you kind of my takeaway from the adult version. Yeah, does anybody want to give some insight into um, who read the middle school version? Is anybody? <laughs> I don't know if you want to give something that, I know you didn't read the other ones, but if there was something that you really enjoyed about that particular version. 
Um, I like the young adult one a lot. But, um, somebody else mentioned that they noticed it had pictures. <laughs> So I think the pictures in the middle were helpful for some of the kids to visualize things a little bit easier. Um, also, as having it as our school-wide read for our staff to read, maybe, it, I mean, I'm not, I didn't read the adult version, so I think for all of our staff to read in maybe a little more timely manner, it might help out a little bit. How many pages is it, approximately? Um, let me see. The young adult one is... 290. And it's written with the same um, author. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Great. And the, the pictures are photographs in the center. Photographs. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Nice. They are nice. Yeah. They, Betsy's got those. It is yeah, nice to kind of have that as you're reading to yeah. visualize. Thanks. And the children's version, did anyone read that? Um, I think Heidi's got it too. This is um, a copy of the children's yeah. version. I would say the coolest thing about this is the, the artistry. Um, yeah. The pictures in here are just remarkable. So same general story. Nice. Yeah, it was written really well for the for kids to understand. I think. Mm -hmm. Even the adult version had images and whatnot, photographs yeah. in there. Okay. It was nice to make a connection with the author and individuals that he was interacting with. Yeah, well, uh, I'm an English professor and I teach uh, climate change literature, post-apocalyptic literature, cli-fi, all that kind of thing. And I was, I was really seeking to read um, some utopias and to read something optimistic, like really for my own mental health because I read a lot of cli-fi as, as do you guys. It's probably why you chose this book. And it just totally fit the bill uh, for my own mind. Um, from a literary perspective, I just thought it was amazingly well-written and the detail, the, the skilled authorship, um, I just thought it was great. It evoked such a sense of place. So I think the value of teaching the book and what I would try to be conveying in the blog is around, you know, it's not just about energy, but it's about sense of place and learning about Africa in such a vivid way um, was so great. And it's really, it's a coming of age story. Um, watching the young boy kind of grow up and the way he learns and is curious and struggles with his schooling, kind of watching him come of age and then be discovered, you know, with the TED Talks and step into his place in science and in this world and to realize that there is a place to step into and be part of these solutions. I just thought it was an amazing book and then the other thing that I'll share that really struck me about the book is the famine and I don't know if you talked about this but it's like 75 pages of famine before you even get to the energy hello <laughs> um, it just goes on and on and on the description of the famine so it's not just a book about energy and you know this ingenious boy it's a book about the starving children in africa and i had really never read anything that so vividly described um what that period was like and you know it was in 2002 and i'm thinking to myself how is it possible that this is going on and you know what was i doing in 2002 and what were my students doing in 2002? It was just, it was just amazing. And what occurred to me is that the, in terms of a work of literature, there's a balance to the book. This long description of the famine creates the ingenuity and the perseverant spirit that leads to the invention and the innovation. You know, it's through the, the suffering years of the famine that this 
learning has meaning. You know what I mean? It made me just think like we need to, there needs to be some suffering to come up with new ideas. So like if I was teaching this book, I would like, I mean, I couldn't make my students do this, but I would like say to them, why don't you try to fast for one day? Or why don't you, why don't you all skip lunch and then we'll talk about renewable energy. You know what I mean? How do you create a little bit of that experience. I, I just thought it was um, a really remarkable book and a great choice for, um, for this group and for anyone who's teaching or reading climate fiction. Um, I will somehow give my email if anyone has an observation that, that I could like include in the blog. I would love to do that, especially since I missed the first half hour of your conversation. Yeah. Feel free if you want to put it in the chat box um, that doesn't get shared um, online. So um, yeah, if anyone else has anything to add, thank you so much, Krista. That was wonderful. Um, we did kind of talk um, about the famine, kind of about like our kids not being able to understand that piece of it. Um, so that's an excellent example of, you know, trying to get them to at least understand a, a piece of it um, that they can um, comprehend what's, what's going on. Um, wonderful. Um, anyone else have any last words about the book? Renewable energy, famine, drought, climate change. <laughs> Guys, I just have a couple of quick things. I'm just going to share my screen really quick here. Um, this is the, can I present this? Can y'all see that? Yes. Great. Okay, so here, um, this is a similar graph um, or um, map to what Beth was showing. Um, this just shows percentage of each state um, and what, uh, what percentage comes from wind energy. Um, so this is from last year. Um, so just showing how much energy we're getting. So if you can find your state, if anybody needs to say anything about their state. <laughs> New Jersey is pathetic. <laughs> well, we talked about that. Yes. Uh, lack of space and things. Um, but just an interesting piece. And this, I, I put the, the site there on the bottom. Um, and this is the group that you were talking about as well, Beth, correct? Yes. Yep. Uh, they've got a great uh, bunch of information, graphs, data, maps, and things. Um, yeah, and they, they have, you know, the fact sheets and the um, calculations on water savings and, uh, you know, other factors that would be helpful. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, okay, so just a couple other things. So next month, October, the end we start from is the book we'll be reading by Megan Hunter. Um, this is a very different book. Um, it's written kind of in prose. Um, there are no real character names. All of the characters have letters for their names. Um, so it's based in, in London and in the UK. Uh, I just saw yesterday, I follow Megan on Twitter, this just came out in paperback, so a cheap option. Um, and then also I heard that this has been sold, the rights to this book have been sold to Bene Benedict Cumberbatch's company, and they will be making it into a movie at some point. So it's really good, it's really powerful. Um, so I hope you all be able to read it. Um, and if you would desire to write a blog um, on um, this book, um, this is just kind of the very brief outline that we give you, um, but I'll send you a free copy of it. It's already sitting on my desk so I can mail it tomorrow. Um, but just looking at how does it work as a story? What's this uh, scientific significance? How could you use this with your students? This one might not be okay for um, younger students, borderline okay for high school, um, maybe more of an adult type book. Um, and then what other um, educational resources could you kind of wrap up in um, with this book? So our next meeting is Tuesday, October 23rd at seven o'clock. Um, I believe we're then uh, into standard time, not daylight time, so <laughs> you can never remember. Um, but how do I stop? Sorry. 
There we go. Um, so if you're interested in writing a blog for us and getting the book, just let me know. Um, you can just email me. Um, just a couple of quick things before we go. Um, Beth was mentioning a lot about green careers. We just released a documentary on green STEM careers. It's 10 minutes long, five uh, interviews with green STEM professionals um, in Minnesota. Um, there's references to Minnesota, but it's very um, okay for a na national audience. Um, there's a discussion guide that goes with it that has discussion questions as well as activities that go along with each of the segments. Like I said, it's only 10 minutes. Um, and then Beth, you were um, talking about how to get your students to understand where their energy comes from. There's a really great lesson in our experience energy curriculum um, that does just that as well as um, an energy audit um, activity um, and pros and cons of different energy sources. So just wanted to plug that all free. Everything's free to download. Um, so yeah, any other questions or last words now at this point? Well, I have to say thank you to everyone and thank you to Krista for the insight and writing the blog. And I, it, it, was, it was just the seven o'clock discussion I wanted, so I enjoyed it. <laughs> Great. Okay, this, is, this is my first opportunity to join a book club, whether um, online or in person. So I was very excited to have a reason to kind of discuss and, and maybe I'll get better at this as we go forward. We did just fine. <laughs> we, did fine. we all did great. <laughs> no, I've, I've said it in the past. It's usually it's a, a tough ask for me on my at seven o'clock. Uh, was on Wednesday nights every every month and uh, but by the time we get done I'm like oh my gosh that was the best hour in the world I loved it <laughs> kids are welcome to join eat absolutely. your supper drink your wine <laughs> absolutely well thank you everybody um, please feel free to email Krista if you've got anything to add um, about the book and um, Email me if you've got any questions about anything else, um, but we really hope that you can join in the future. If you can't come one month, that's fine. Um, yeah, spread the word, bring your friends. Thank and, you. Right, thank, thank you very everyone. much. Have a great night. Yeah.